Um, hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this final session of Worldviews, Latin American Art and the Decolonial Turn. Please be reminded that this event is live uh, translated and you can access the translations by clicking in the bottom right of your Zoom screen where there should be an icon that looks like a globe. Um, please do put your questions into the chat or Q&A boxes throughout the event and we will embed them in the discussion or direct them straight to the speakers. So over the past four weeks, um, I have, I feel like I've learned so much and I am extremely lucky and I feel indebted to all the participants to this conference who have shared their thinking, research and practice, really um, shedding so much light on the groundbreaking practices of, uh, of what we have called these worldviews that are in becoming. So tonight's theme is activism and collective practice. And of course, we're all familiar with the relationship between art and activism, which is one that in many ways has been canonized. And it is also one that has really resisted forms of institutional um, containment and continually urges us to question the way we organize culture, the way we engage with what um, Silvia Rivera Cusicanchi has talked about as those insurgent social forces that push the social body to take action and to alter the status quo. So uh, during this final session, um, we will see, we, we will be able to take some of the loose ends of the conference and, and really talk about the numerous overlaps that have uh, emerged between the papers, uh, all of which are pre-recorded and which I remind everyone once again to uh, go and watch on our website, worldviews.online. And I am excited to talk about all of this and more during uh, this evening's roundtable discussion with speakers uh, Aneli Mariza Aliaga, Liliana Clavijo, Felipe Hernandez, uh, Kirak Sonorica, and, and Ventura Profana. And Tamita, Tabita Rezaire, unfortunately, is not going to be able to join us today. Um, and I will introduce the speakers more in detail after the keynote. So the panel this evening is chaired by Keina Eleison, whose vision really has brought this session to life. Uh, Keina, who really needs no introduction, is a curator, writer, researcher, uh, Eris, uh, Jivaral Harris and Shaman, a narrator, singer, and ancestral chronicler. And currently she is a professor at the School of Visual Arts at Parque Lage in, in Rio. And she's also the artistic director of the Museum of Modern Art in Rio, in part partnership with Pablo La Fuente. Uh, at last, I am honored to introduce the missionary, pastor, evangelist, singer, writer, composer, and visual artist, Ventura Profana, who is the final keynote speaker of the World Views Conference. So Ventura joins us from Belo Horizonte in Brazil, and she is the daughter of the mysterious entrails of Mother Bahia, she prophesizes multiplication and abundant black, indigenous and travesty life. Her practice is rooted in researching the implications and methodologies of Deuteronomism in Brazil and abroad through the uh, spread of neo-Pentecostal churches. Um, this event will be recorded. Thank you all for being here and a really big welcome to Ventura Profana. Thank you very much for joining us. Olá, olá. Eu tenho... Hello, everyone. I am so grateful for being here. Thank you to all of the spiritual forces that have brought me here. I will now begin sharing my screen. I am Ventura Profana, daughter of the deep interiors, where the many dancing waters flow darkly, that enrage with the purpose of drowning the Lord of Lords. I make myself a shepherdess for the shepherds to annihilate them. Our herds, schools, and swarms are self determined. We risk everything for the earthly freedom and abundance, we will not be taken to slaughterhouses. In us, 
the punishment will no longer be present the punishment that brings peace to white people no lord will be the god among us cursed are the nations whose god is the lord to illustrate these words i would like to show some of the collage works i've worked on we blow trumpets we work miracles we jump walls and we break the curses we are the heirs of all of the impossible but we bear the responsibility and transcestral commitment to gestate generate and manage infinite possibilities which are cracks bridges erasures leaks hiding places oases dissimilar to logical rational and temporal human notions of what it means to live think enjoy speak inhabit and multiply we are the trembling of the mountains hurling far to the ground the redeemer to which we do not surrender breaking him to dust we despise salvation and we pursue freedom how to stop and or face the lying destructive and murderous impulse of the god of abraham isaac and jacob what are the trails and roots fully capable of separating the disguised necropolitical time plane of dominion and sovereignty intended and crossed by the roman catholic apost apostolic order how to remember when from birth we're made captive in the cathedrals of oblivion how to establish unfathomable alliances among us tracing paths that confuse the enemy's wisdom and provide us with the possibility to enjoy our own abundance and genuine diversity in the name of the god of israel our tent was destroyed all our string tents were torn apart however we live in all of the temples there were also centuries sums of months bits of ages stretches of generations supported by tendons intertwined at all times we are the wall of the eye the wind that invades and escapes through the window portals irregardless of the colonial control ventania the wind has no homeland homelands are the valleys of dry bones our profanation is to live seven times longer it is to forget the sea's genderness without power i go down the slopes chanting litanies and spirituals of life and victory turning to no stumble over skulls escaping the ordeals that all western streets are big large as the oceans are our wounds how will we cure them crab spider serum does not cure rattlesnake bites so it is considering christianity one of the fundamental engines of the full functioning of the colonial machine i believe in an evangelistic healing practices in this case the gospel of the end that is liberation through the pentecostal disorientation what i seek to develop artistically musically and theologically is the constant exercise of killing the lord as a fundamental step in breaking with the perverse way white way of practicing theology i feel like this works disconnect the imagery and legacy of jesus like the white cisgender man we want to free him from the lordly status to which he was imprisoned and eternalized through the broad commitment and participation of the eurocentric and art 
Eurocentric art and historiography. At the same time, I honor and acknowledge the transfiguration experiences of Jesus, connecting the causes and circumstances of his conviction and death, along with the critical positions against the prevailing social-political supremacist regimes in Jerusalem during his incarnated life. Here, I underpin the coincidence of having been murdered in a humiliating and brutal way even before he turned 35. This age corresponds to the estimated average life of Brazilian transvestites and transsexual people in 2020. According to data from the dossier presented by the National Association of Transvestites and Transsexuals, ANTHRA. I try to think of Christian theology as a mysterious path of transmutation, shedding a light on Jesus and seeing him as a black transvestite person as I revive and reincarnate the memories of his erratic conduct. By leaning on the word of the Lord and by tracking his steps, intentions and articulations, by mapping the bloodthirsty choreographies and unveiling codes and languages, I can dialogue with those who are still under the yoke of Christian spiritual slavery from a repertoire that makes meaning, that, that makes sense to them, creating, creating useful loopholes to stir up desires, memories, dreams, and memories of love and freedom towards the land that is free from pesticide, chemicals in white lord lands. What I advocate for is not the death of God, but the right to transition God. As I create this collage, I try to observe all of these choreographies. I assess all of these movements I try to see and assess power and the ways through which the enemy's power is built and the way this has been structured in the colonial age and from then on and by looking at those images I create new possibilities of life, new ways towards victory, ways of abundance and transvestite plenitude. According to James H. Cohn, the function of theology is to analyze the meaning of liberation for the so oppressed people who can know that their struggle for political, social justice and economic justice, and here I include environmental justice, is in line with the gospel of Jesus. Any message not related to the release of dissenting people in this society is not the message of Jesus. Any theology that is indifferent to the theme of liberation is not Christian theology. Here is our gospel. The propagation of the end of perpetual desolation imagined and traced by cisgender patriarchy whiteness, demonically impregnated in our lands and hearts painted with a spiritual ink in a violent fashion. In Isaiah 53, the prophet confirms to us the fleshly nature of Jesus, in addition to exposing the way this was perceived by society when he tells us that, quote, he had neither beauty nor good appearance, it was not good looking, it was not desired, it was despised, it was the most rejected among men. And I say, transvestite of pain and experienced at work, as one from whom men hid their face. She was despised and no one cared about her. Therefore, the missionary work as a poetic and spiritual challenge consists of multiple multiplying congregations where we can love and simulate the S, cultivating 
the powerful one to swallow and destroy the structures of the courts where racism, ableism, misogyny and transphobia set in. Starting and considering the S as the foundation, those who decolonize transcend the cross. That is, life is in the S and that reconciles us with other worlds, not accusing, uh, accusing us of being sinners. And there were, therefore, the word is reconciliation. So we are ambassadors of the S, as if someone prayed for us. We want to be reconciled with life. Some are seen as prophets, evangelists, witches, pastors, and teachers, preparing the profane women to the work of the ministry so that the body may be built up until we reach the unity of faith and the knowledge of the S, and we reach maturity, reaching this state of fullness. Those wishes began before me. These wishes can't be translated to Portuguese, English, or Spanish. These are other stories for our congregation. Congregations of which we are the head, the body, and the tail. Yes, we do have a tail. We have a lion's tail that looks like a church. The great interest of the enemy is focused on eradicating any and all possibilities of meetings between those who are disobedient. And in this case, disobeying means to, be, to have weapons and to have thoughts and imagination that sprout, produce, and feed from contradiction. According to Castiel Vitorino Brasileiro, quote, we are contrary and contradictory when we leave what is impossible for the colonizer. And in this time, when the enemies of Jesus are still set on thrones of glory, power, and majesty, the disobedient congregations are broken at the edge of the sword. It makes me think of the events that followed the execution of Yeshua and the brutal reality of persecution to which their disciples and companions on the journey were submitted. In Acts of the Apostle 2.13, the Bible reveals to us that when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in agreement in the same place and suddenly a sound came from the sky like a rushing and impetuous wind filling the house in which they were sitting and they saw split tongues as if made of fire, which rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the spirit and began to speak in tongues as the spirit bade them. What draws my attention is that the episode in which the church's birthday is attributed to so one of the dorsal celebrations of Pentecostal faith and thought is actually an event that is deeply marked by incorporation. That is, by the meeting and the relationship with Jesus' soul amid the gathering of those who are hated in this world, the worst among nations, which is prostitutes, transvestites, cannibals, and many other species and abominations. It was the collective practice and the gathering of those who were disobedient and those who were disoriented among the followers of Jesus who made it possible for them to forget tongues and colonial languages while remembering their mother tongues, the tongues of their mothers and grandmothers. 
Acts also shows the incomprehension of the colonizer who was astonished and perplexed, asking themselves, what does this mean? And pointing at them as if they were crazy or drunk, dodging, dribbling in a supernatural sphere. They are nicknamed of a miracle. However, they present capoeira and witchcraft. The tricks are what allows us to breathe beyond that, far from the malignant action of whiteness. To conclude, I say, there is nor there was any resurrection. I reiterate, there is nor there was any resurrection. The glory, the honor, the strength and the power of Jesus are manifested through transmutation, which is inevitable. I quote Octavia E. Butler to remind us that every change can bring the seed of benefit. Look for them. Every change can bring the seed of harm. I caution you. We are infinitely malleable. We are the change. That's it. Those were my brief words. Thank you so much, um, Ventura. This has been... Um, this was like a trip uh, for me. I mean, I, I entered a spiritual space also because your voice echo, I was listening to the English translation and there was a, your voice was kept lower. And so there was this double voice. It was almost as if you were speaking from a temple. Uh, so actually, even in the translation, there was this amazing dimension and you're concluding with Octavia E. Butler um, and you know, reconnecting us to science fiction, which really is, what you know, Donna Haraway talks about is speculative fabulation and this need that we have to reimagine and reconfigure. But I'll hold my comments now. <laughs> and instead, um, I'm very happy to begin the roundtable discussion with our wonderful speakers. Um, uh, the first is, well, Anneli Marisa Aliaga, who is a British Bolivian. Uh, and Phil student at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Cambridge. She's working on Andean studies, post-colonialism and decolonial cinema. And she is editor in chief of the bilingual Bolivian magazine, Bolivian Express, which is in La Paz. And she's currently working on her PhD proposal. Um, then we have, we're lucky to have Felipe Hernandez, who is uh, an architect and also the director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Cambridge. He is going to be visiting professor at Brown University in the new year, where he's working on a new monograph on architecture and decoloniality. Uh, his paper was written in collaboration with Liliana Clavijo, who is assistant professor um, at the School of Architecture and at the Universidad del Valle in Cali, where she leads the project, um, the projects department and the MA in architecture and urbanism. Her research examines collective housing, modern and postmodern architecture, cultural heritage, and uh, learning uh, in the Latin American context. Uh, finally, we have Kira Sonorica, which I, of course, I'm not pronouncing well, but is in, uh, who is an inter interdisciplinary artist, writer, and theorist. Her work draws on the complexities of trauma and colonial power, powers, pathologization, trans and queer temporalities, knowledge production from the global south, internet aesthetic, and the resi uh, and resilient organization. She teaches art at, uh, and Paraguayan art history at the National University of Asuncion. And what we will be doing now is um, offer the chance to each speaker for three minutes to give a quick overview of their presentations that are available to view online. And from there, we can jump off with our discussion. Um, thank you again. Please switch on your cameras and join in. And actually, shall we go in alphabetical order? <laughs> yeah. 
is that all right? So Annelien, perhaps you go first. And actually, you know, Kena, our wonderful chair, please take over. I'm going to silence myself. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you all for being here together. And I'm just switch for Portuguese for a little bit, just to tell Ventura to a father. And then I will uh, come back for my English because this is what's particular for her. Because as you said, Sophia, uh, we listen Ventura as a temple and uh, because Ventura can understand not only her body, but uh, herself as a temple. So it was very, very interesting. So let's start with, with uh, our round table with anyone, only three minutes, it's okay, Sophia? Three minutes for each one? Yeah, just, she just tell that three minutes is good for us to have time to, to understand more around that. So that's yeah, absolutely. That's that. I would also like to invite Kira to join us where she's here. So. Yes. Yes. So we first, Anneli, then um, Felipe, then Liliana, then Kira, that's it. No, no. Kira, then Liliana, that's it. So please, Anneli, can you start? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I just finished the master's program in Latin American studies at Cambridge University. And um, my presentation was based on the research that I did for my master's. Um, which was on the political Bolivian cinema group called Grupo Camao, who were active in the 60s and continue making films today. And they were responsible for creating the first feature length films in Quechua and Aymara, the two dominant languages, indigenous languages of the Andes. So in my dissertation, I look at their cinematographic trajectory. I look at the socio-political contexts in which the films they created were made in. And I propose that they took some very significant steps um, as part of the new Latin American cinema movement and now in line with the Bolivian government's mission to decolonize Bolivia more generally and decolonize culture. I propose that they took some very important steps towards um, decolonizing cinema. And so as part of my argument, I propose a framework on what it means to decolonize cinema, uh, which involves deconstructing oppressive cultural images of indigenous peoples, and um, which is and the theme which is very much in line with the um, topic of the seminar today is that um, a huge uh, and very vital part of decolonizing cinema involves this creation of cross-cultural relationships between filmmakers and indigenous communities, especially with the rise of self-representative indigenous media nowadays. And then the final um, element of this uh, framework involves uh, creating a cinematic form that moves away from Hollywood and Western models of cinema and instead embraces and complements indigenous worldviews. So therefore creating films that embrace maybe more cyclical narratives as opposed to linear narratives. So I would say that's probably my um, brief summary of, of what um, I'm gonna be presenting on. So thank you, Emily. So we jump to Felipe. Thank you, thank you, Kena. Um... I think I speak uh, uh, on, on my own behalf, as well as uh, on behalf of Liliana. Uh, we, we both um, uh, co-wrote co the paper. And thank you very much to all of you, but also uh, um, for this opportunity to, to, to um, share with you our experience about uh, Cali, uh, our paper that was entitled Collective Constructions in, in, in Cali, Decolonizing Art and Public Space in Cali. Uh, refers to recent events in, in the city of, of Cali where um, as a result of the national uh, strike um, a few months ago, uh, the indigenous Misak, a uh, group of indigenous people from the south of Colombia, demolished the uh, statue of the founder of the city, um, an act that was considered to be vandalic by uh, the white mestizo elite of the city. And then at the same time, 
a, a, co a collective of people from various parts of the city, different races and genders and uh, uh, social classes and, 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 and inhabitants of the city built a monument that, that is a hand um, 10 meters tall that is called uh, the monument, Monumento a la Resistencia, the Monument to Resistance. Um, and this is in, a, in, a, in, the, in the south east of the Cali. Um, and we want to compare uh, the, the, the meaning that a statue may have, a statue that was designed by a single male white European author uh, for the for founder of the city uh, versus these hands, which was collectively produced uh, with donations by the public uh, day and night over a few days, 10 days or something like this, uh, in order to complete a symbol that represents collectively what the city is for, it, for its inhabitants. Uh, so we were lucky to, to uh, listen to Bonaventura de Sousa when he actually mentioned our, our monument. And, uh, and he spoke about uh, the, in my notes here from, from his wonderful presentation, that there is no aesthetic for the epistemologies of the South. Uh, and of course, we're talking about a, a hand, a monument, uh, a kind of sculpture that does not fit clearly or very well within structures of uh, aesthetic or artistic judgment, uh, but is by all means a monument that represents uh, the, uh, the, 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 the situation of the city. I guess I'm trying to find in my notes the terms that uh, were used by Buenaventura de Sosa the, uh, to express the indignation, he said, uh, for years of abuse and oppression. So, so is this kind of new collective practice, very much in, in, in following the name of this, of this panel, sort of the terms in which the, the collective comes together to express that indignation, producing a new monument that does not fit well within structures of artistic judgment, contemporary artistic judgment, and yet forces to think about a new aesthetic uh, for, uh, for Colombia and for Cali. Thank you, Felipe, and uh, Kira, please, can you join us? Sí. Um, antes que nada, muchas gracias, Sofía, Michael, y Keina. Thank you very much uh, to all for everything, and it's a pleasure to share this space with Ventura also, and with all of you. In my work, I talk about a colonial matrix of subjectivation. And I start by saying that there is not a line, a chronological line of timeline, but it goes back and forth. I talk about how the Western culture has institutionalized uh, the future through religion and policies so that they can be controlled and foreseen. And these are words about futurism. The colonial matrix of subjectivation is just whiteness and heterosexuality. And it's a way of constructing subjectivism, but also a way of constructing uh, a way of life around uh, the otherness and referring it or from a point of view, from an objective, white objective point of view and heterosexual. I talk about how impacted I am of the material conditions of the white people, especially the way they construct a trans genocide where trans people are striving for systemic access that are guaranteed for everybody else through political infrastructures that guarantee the access to safe housing, food security, etc. So from there on, I analyze this genealogy of colonialism that since the 1500s, since they arrived in the Avellala territories, start building this uh, idea of deviancy, 
to frame the nonconformity of gender. But at the same time, this builds these notions of monstrosity, animality, bestiality that are the uh, opposed to human. And this is built through the printing press, through the Theodore de Bright uh, images that never visited these territories, but built these images based on those uh, references. And it also talks about the corporalities that we now know as intersex. These are the corporalities from other corporal morphologies and how at the same time, these mechanisms of misrepresentation through images, misrepresentation of information, design polarizing narratives about the others and how in Paraguay, which is where I speak from today, this medieval temporality still prevails. So, Taking this into consideration, I talk about a specific case that w occurred here, which, which was uh, the case of Maritza, a, tra a transvestite sexual worker who was disrespected or felt disrespected by a customer when doing sex work and how this became viral through the media and how this was also appropriated by the institution of art and how its anger somehow was extracted and converted into something profitable. So based on this, I also analyzed the conditions of transphobia and transphilia, which are the two phases of a problematic that somehow frame the existence of transcorporalities. I also analyze in my work what the strategies the uh, trans artists are using today to somehow uh, stay away from that. And I talk about Sofia Moreno's work. In her case, her image was also somehow appropriated and extracted in her case. She had a private erotic videos and this was stolen by a computer technician and it was shown or exposed. And how this colonial logic of uh, punishing femininity and also sanctions this strange corporality. Sophia's work is very important for Latin American art, I believe because it talks about how the trans feminine people can construct agencies. It also speaks to a kind of how to think about the post, about this traumatic experience. And in her work is also related to a community, how you build communities. And I also talk about Arian Carrillo's and Emoral's work. There are two trans artists here in Paraguay. Arian Carrillo's work is digital art. And it dismantles all of these architecture of gender. and how uh, the others are antibodies or how you build this image. And also how you reproduce cannibalization of transcorporalities and also the intersection of fat corporalities. This is another very important frontier. Thank you very much. 
talk more and more. And uh, just to finish all the presentations, uh, uh, Liliana, please, can you join us? Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, yo agregaría, pues, um, la, pues, la ponencia la, la construimos con Felipe. Eh, agregaría en, en este eh, conflicto social que vivimos desde abril en Colombia, el epicentro fue en Cali, eh, la construcción del monumento a la resistencia como una manera de eh, mostrar el dolor, es decir, el dolor puesto eh, en, desde diferentes actores, donde este monumento de construcción colectiva, eh, donde participaron grafiteros, donde participaron diferentes artistas, fueron convocados de manera anónima y ese es su valor, porque está puesto en un lugar, en el espacio público, en la ciudad, eh, y representa también, digamos, eh, las injusticias que, que, que fueron eh, objeto de esta manifestación social, la violación a las mujeres, eh, la, el uso excesivo de la fuerza pública eh, en diferentes escenarios de la ciudad, las muertes extrajudiciales, eh, la violación de los niños, eh, todas las minorías representadas en este monumento. Entonces, agregaría eso y muchas gracias por eh, este espacio. Thank you very much, uh, Liliana and Anneli, Felipe, Equida. Um, for me, it's very uh, important to, to understand how we built this moment now, because when uh, I was invited by uh, Sofia and Michael to understand this round table and this moment with us. Thinking around being Ventura as a keynote or someone that can bring uh, to us the idea uh, around how I am connected with art. It's, it's very strongly connected with uh, power. When we talk around art, we are talking around power. And uh, this for me is very uh, interesting because we are, uh, sometimes we don't like to talk around this. We don't like to, to tell about how uh, we are connected with, with the urging or, or hunting or even uh, desiring power. And uh, with this kind of connection with the religion, not kind of, but this connection with religion, I can understand uh, uh, Ventura as someone that can show us in a very uh, important way how uh, this can be recognized. And it, this is very interesting too, because we did not use the word decolonize or decolonization very much around that, because it's not only around colony, it's around which ways the power can be or do. Because when we think around colony or decolonization, we're still in the same track of the colony. And it's very important to understand that today, we're not talk talking only about decolonization. We are over there. We're just like, okay, it's important, but we are over, we, are, we want more than decolonize. We want to, uh, show that we already understand the time space are something that is rounded, not only a line. We can understand that uh, the idea uh, of collectivity do not kill the idea of the individuality. And uh, we can understand how uh, we can live, love and die in a very different ways. And this is very, uh, for me, powerful to, to talk with uh, Ventura and with you all that uh, are here. And uh, I, we have some questions, but I have one question to, to Ventura just to start, just to start this. Uh, because we are, when I, we are saying that, when I say around power, I'm very connected with the idea with the communication of power. And for me, it's very uh, interesting because uh, I speak English, Portuguese, and Spanish. So I feel a little, a little powerful here because I can understand a lot of uh, uh, epistemologies 
connected with Eurocentric way of doing. But in the same way, how can we connect not only centric way, not only Eurocentric way, but because of, because we speak in Eurocentric language, we can move through that with our body. Our body as a bridge or something around that. It's for you, Ventura. I'm sorry, I don't feel that powerful. I don't feel as powerful as you do. Because I know that this is a challenge. We want to go beyond these borders. We're looking for new ways to communicate. We're looking for new ways of creating new possibilities of time, new possibilities of life, new ways to desire things, new ways to create or imagine or to liberate our imagination. And we want those ideas to be part of our bodies, to be part of our bodies that are Earth and to bring all of that to the spaces we live in. And to do so, we can make use of different language and different ways to communicate. That is what I'm trying to elaborate here. How can we all be connected? How can we bond and go beyond these limits, limits that are imposed by the historiography and linguistic Eurocentric um, dominance. Uh, yes, I completely agree, but not only linguistic, like the whole uh, uh, idea of uh, this connection that we, we, that you can communicate, you know, that not only through the voice, but with your whole body, I can understand around that. And uh, we have questions, uh, uh, questions from Paulo Abraão. Uh, Ventura, once I heard you say that we need more churches and less museums. When I say this for some colleagues that wasn't raised by evangelic church, they never understand and they then made little shock around that. Can you talk more about that? And another, uh, to connect with the Paulo, uh, your, your collage uh, always have some questions of science involved. Uh, some question of human body, pollutions, and where they came, when, where, when and where came this interest around the scientific things? Well, that's something I need. I've been trying to understand the situation in precise terms. I'm trying to steer away from human sciences or from this human science-like way of thinking. I'm trying to go towards exact sciences. I'm trying to look for observatory methods. Since I was very young, I was always away from exact sciences, mathematics, chemistry, physics, and this knowledge is essential. That's why I study those subjects so much. I want to learn about bombs, I want to learn about war, I want to learn about the enemy's artillery, how weapons are built, and then through images, I like to observe those pieces of knowledge and then create relations amongst them. I mean, when I think of the bone structure of birds, I try to relate those with the drones and flying weapons of the Israeli government, for example. 
So this is the path I go down. And I do think that communication wise, it's not only about language. This is also a spiritual element. We still have to remember how to access this knowledge. Now, I don't even remember when I said what I said, when I said that we need more churches and less museums. Well, in any case, I was born and raised in a city where there was no museum whatsoever, and there was a number of churches. So I was awakened towards artistry inside these temples and the power of the congregation, the joy of the congregation and the way churches were articulated to heal some individual and collective wounds was something that inspired me a lot. Now, since I'm a transvestite, I was expelled from church, I was expelled from this place, but I still admire these places because I witnessed how efficient of a work they do in churches. In Brazil, in our context, especially evangelic churches have been multiplying exponentially, and this is quite frightening. And this is a problem as well, but in this case, I'm interested in observing why that happens, when and how they act. For example, churches do social work where we do not have any state initiative. So when I say that we need these ephemeral spaces, when I say that we need congregations and churches, what I try, I'm trying to say is that I wish museums were not the temples they are, temples full of objects and stolen experiences. I wish museums were places where we could develop a practice of love, affection, where we could care for each other, where we could feed those who are hungry, where we could share water for those who are thirsty. Yes. Thank you. We have one more question, but this question I, I really want to ask, not only for you, uh, but for uh, Liliana and uh, Felipe, and of course, uh, to Anneli and Kira. Uh, it's, it's around the presidency. Do you think the representativity is a tool of decoloniality? I know that it's a tricky question, but uh, uh, because sometimes we need to understand more around what is representativity, but uh, I really like to open the question for our round table. I, I, I can say for point someone, but who wants to start you can start please. I guess I guess I could say something about it. I think that Anneli perhaps um, she 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 um, talks about representation uh, uh, directly in in her presentation. So I think she probably can say something uh, to the effect of the importance of self representation in in sort of decolonial agendas. Uh, I, I think that in 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 our case, I suppose Liliana, you can add something. Uh, uh, it, it's it's very it's very representativity. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I'm not sure that particular sort of word as representativity, but certainly representation. Um, in a, in a, in a, in a, in our in our paper, what we what we noticed is is the is that what the indigenous people stood uh, uh, against 
was uh, the fact that they didn't feel represented by the statue of a uh, founder of the city, that the founder of the city stood for an idea of the city and for a certain principles that actually made them uh, peripheral to society. Sort of they, the indigenous have been excluded, have suffered from all sorts of racism and exclusion, and, uh, and that was indeed their own land. And this statue is, is taken to represent uh, the foundation of the city, the history of the city, and the culture of the city. So, so, so they stood against that. And the hand that was built by not only indigenous people, but by all, all kinds of artists from uh, different parts of, of the city uh, stands to represent uh, as we as we said in our in our presentation, stands to represent the to represent the histories of all those other people who are not uh, represented in the history, who have been excluded from the history of the city, whose contribution is actually deleted in many cases uh, from the terms in which we understand Cali as a city. So so I guess uh, uh, in terms of whether or not it is important uh, uh, for the coloniality, uh, for the colonization, I think it's an aspect of it and, uh, and, and, and perhaps an important aspect of it. But, if, but it seems to me that we ought to bear in, in mind that the, that the decolonial agenda is a very broad and complex agenda where many parts uh, play an important uh, a role. Please, Liliana. Um, yo creo que como arquitectos, um, también la ciudad I think en... that as architects, the city also has this representation or representativeness. It was taken down. And so the statue of the founder was taken down and that area is an elite region. And this, what it does is produce like this confrontation with social groups in this, in this space of the city. And where the monument for resistance was built, th that place is a more popular area. It has other space codes. And it's also a place where even the socioeconomic aspect is lower, but it's much more inclusive. People can walk around there, people, I mean, it's, it's more inclusive. And these spatial codes are very important because of what they represent, what those areas represent in the city. This is all very important to take into account when we think about the decolonial agenda that Felipe proposes. So it's more about how we read the spatial codes of the city and there are areas where it seems that we can't enter and there are areas where we feel more comfortable perhaps and where do we have more of that effect of a practice like throwing down a statue or putting up a statue anonymously. Yeah, so what I would add to that is um, in the case of visual arts, I think at the kind of forefront of the, the politics of representation is this question of authorship. So with self-representative practices of um, subalterns, let's say, um, the this kind of inherently links to power and the decolonial agenda, right? If you have control of the image that you wanna present in visual arts and in visual culture, then you kind of innately have the power to present the, the favorable image that you wanna put forward. So, I mean, in, in post-colonial thought, um, Edward Said speaks extensively in culture and imperialism, the link between the two, like, who has the power to narrate? And in my research, I sort of question, you know, who has the power to speak on behalf of who, or, or who has the power to create representations? And so that's what is so um, important about this rise of self-representative indigenous media is that indigenous communities are now with full authorship allowed to put forward the images that they want to put forward of themselves and their struggles. And so I think I would say that at the heart of the politics of representation is this question of authorship. Kira, do you want to add something? Yes. Um, 
esta cuestión de, de la representatividad. Yes, this uh, issue of representative representation, something must be represented is because there is a an economic an economy that prevents it from being represented. And this makes me think about this discussion of visibility that happened in the last decade about what are the effects of visibility and how this can contribute to the improvement of the life conditions. And here I refer to the uh, trans uh, otherness in Paraguay. I think representativity is important, but I also believe that this must also bring with it a way of change, a form of change that impacts the way we improve material conditions. This is what I can add in terms of activism and how decolonization has contributed to generate precarious infrastructures that today we have to think about these negotiations. Not only think on the effects, I would also like to think about how this can benefit directly. We have question, question, more questions. And uh, well, for Annelise, um, how, Annelise, how is this antagonism present in the film? And another one after for Liliana and Felipe, you talked about a new aesthetic that is incompatible with institutions. How had this bounced off institutions? This can be a question for everyone. So, but uh, I just put these two uh, questions together because I think we can uh, have a connection around that because uh, the idea of the antagonism and the idea uh, of uh, yes and non institutions are a little connected. So please, Annelise. Annelie, sorry. Sorry, the question was on antagonism or resistance. In indigenous film? Yes, antagonism present in film. How is this antagonism that you told is mm -hmm. present in film? Uh, it, I can speak about indigenous film um, and how uh, this kind of anti colonial uh, framework operates, um, especially in the case of um, Ukamal. Um, and this kind of also addresses Michael's question. Um, he asked a question separately to the hosts and panelists about how this cinema group has evolved and how they now, um, uh, so they started in the 60s and how they operate um, in a contemporary kind of setting. So um, when the group Okamal started, they were um, operating kind of against the state. They were um, working it, during times of uh, right-wing military dictatorships. Um, and many of the themes that they address in their films are very anti-imperialist um, and um, very pro-Indigenous rights. And so I would say that while their earlier films perhaps reflect um, more in the themes and the content, this kind of anti-imperialist, anti-colonial stance, their modern day cinema tends to focus um, on indigenous resistance, uh, perhaps in form, in cinematic form. So one of the main things I look at in my research is how the cinema group has opposed um, Western models of cinema. And I mean, it's really interesting because cinema as a was an imperial tool. And so it, it is rooted in the colonial gaze. And so it's very interesting how um, indigenous media counteracts that and forms 
uh, resistance in both form and content. In content reflected through themes um, and uh, resistance against governments, resistance against uh, imperial and colonial legacy, and in, con and in form, sorry, um, more uh, following indigenous um, ways of thinking. So perhaps adopting more cyclical narratives of film. Um, there, the cinema group also uses um, different shots which complement indigenous thought. Um, there's a concept in Quechua and Aymara um, Cosmos, which is the um, concept of Naira Pacha, um, which is a kind of spatial and uh, time related concept of indigenous thought. And they uh, try to adopt this in their cinematography. So I would say that, um, that that has been the biggest change that perhaps at the beginning, this cinema group tended to focus more on um, resistant themes. And now they've kind of evolved their cinematography to adopt these new models of cinema, which kind of fully embrace um, indigenous thought. Ina, could you could you repeat the, the question, especially the, the bit on, on institutions? I, I did not. Right, right. Uh, you talked, uh, Liliane and Filippi, you talked about a new aesthetic that is incompatible with institutions. Mm. How had this bounced off institutions? Yes. Uh, um... Yeah, yes, yes. I think that that there, there are a number of institutions that we that we sort of indirectly refer to, um, and one of them, for example, is the artist. Uh, and I and I think that that in in the case of the statue of the founder of the city, I guess it was it was a commissioned commissioned by the local government with the support of the local elite uh, who financed the uh, 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 the the production of the statue. Uh, by um, by an artist who had been trained as an artist at a, at a, at a school of art uh, and happened to be, he was Spanish and happened to be in Colombia accidentally actually, uh, when he was commissioned to, to build this, this statue. And, and, and we are contrasting uh, that particular uh, a prod, a, a art product with one that is uh, produced by uh, some artists, perhaps professionally trained uh, uh, in, in schools, but a vast majority of people who were not trained as artists um, and, and were builders or, or, or children or just members of the society. Uh, uh, and, they, and they produce this new piece that actually uh, stands as a, as a new kind of, of product. And it doesn't fit particularly within, within sort of art history of artistic classifications. Uh, it's very hard to, to, to insert it within that history. And, and sort of paraphrasing uh, Buenaventura de Sosa's description of that, of that, of that same uh, uh, sculpture, the, the hand holding the, the word resistance, I think that the centering the ocular regime regime of sort of traditional art, sort of presenting a new form of, of uh, uh, evaluating the sort of artistic and aesthetics as artistic production production and aesthetics in order to represent uh, these uh, uh, um, histories that have been excluded, as I've said before. I think that 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 sort of institution, one is the art male dominated inst institution. The other of course is, uh, is the city, the city which now requires that we, that we develop uh, a sort of more dynamic mechanisms to understand the contributions of all sorts of, of citizens and residents rather than the terms in which uh, a few of them and usually architects or, 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 or technicians project and imagine the city uh, for, a very, for a homogenous society. Uh, Liliana, do you want to add something? Because it was the for both of for both. Um, creo que es importante la... Yes, I believe it's important. La educación, es decir, la... Education is important. As universities as a scenario to question these effects of colonization in the building of these patterns of what is correct in art. In the scenario of the universities, it has been widely discussed how the artists are trained 
how these artists are trained that produce these works of art, but also validating other types of practices. However, I believe that the problem here is how the people that are not trained as artists have this uh, view of the city and actually attack people with these acts simply by painting a mural. This can be vandalism when they use a wall, but other people see it as art. So how art really can impact citizens in homogeneous terms, because I do believe that the role of academics as an institution is to have these discussions, but does this reach the citizens? This is the question. That's why this act was seen as vandalism and it was disqualified. Even the construction of the monument to resistance was taken to the city hall as an invasion of public space. It was not an act of a collective movement, but it was uh, an invasion of public space, which did, this is how the, the two things are just. I think he did press another question here. Uh, uh, Michael, Michael asks uh, uh, a, a critical, a critical, makes a critical point here, says, does the statue of the hand need to be understood as an aesthetic object? Doesn't that in itself extract it from its political purpose? And I think you, you're right, Michael, it, it, there is a danger in, in doing that, uh, uh, in, in, in sort of understanding as an aesthetic object. But also, I think that the, 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 the argument is, is, is brought up by the terms in which the elites propose the destruction of the hand, because uh, the same people who uh, uh, condemned the, uh, the, 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 the demise of the, of the statue of the founder uh, then initiated a campaign to demolish the hand. And the reason why it should be demolished is because it was an eyesore. Uh, so, 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 so I think that that is an interesting situation by which I guess the, the aesthetic qualities or the different aesthetic qualities, so, so to speak, may actually uh, to a large extent endow the hand with, a, with, with greater political uh, 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 um, value. Um, I don't know if that if that sort of answers the question, but I'm, I'm trying to say how, how seeing as a new new aesthetic device in this particular case uh, 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 conveys a, a much stronger message against that uh, uh, univocal narrative of, of artistic production. And uh, I really want to provocate something here because in the same way, even when uh, the aesthetic of the act was like took it out and was called like vandalism we put again in a place of the art because you're here as creator artists and talking around that so it's again around power so uh, the movement that can put uh, one thing person act sound and the world of art it's not only uh, 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 one person, it's this, this kind of institutionalization of something, because now we are in a very important university, uh, speaking in three languages around art, and we talk around this. So this, again, are inside of the art world, and only with the movement that you, Liliana, are talking around that. So uh, people we research, and we'll uh, understand more and say, yes, this is art or not, this is vandalism. But again, it's around this, like something that I really like to say, it's around the dancing around that. And when I say dancing, I, I really like to, to, to say that I realize that dancing uh, around this connection and this connection, it's, a uh, non-Eurocentric way of thinking to put things in a place. Not in the, the, we are not only inside of a war, we can be understanding how can you balancing these uh, things. But we have more questions. I know a lot of questions. I don't know if we're gonna have time to talk with each other, but 
let's uh, um, uh, for Kira, the way you theorize the body through notions of monstrosity re resonates Ventura's words on metaphorsis, metamorphosis or metamorphosing the remain life. This beautiful connects with an understanding of the body as a community of being beings working collectivity um, as opposed to a singular individual. So we are understanding collective practice as something that exists also, also at a molecular level. Can you talk more disconnections? So it's for Kira and Ventura too. And I'm sorry, Kira, I'm saying your, your name in the right way is Kira. So, um, Sophia, could you elaborate more on uh, the last part? So, understanding collective practice as something that exists also at a molecular level. Um, Are you asking for Sophia? Yes. Sophia, can you join us? <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I was writing it down, but actually much easier to appear. Yes. Um, well, basically, I was thinking about, I mean, your two contributions also in connection with Tabita's uh, meditation that I don't know if you had a chance to do. Um, and where there is this connection, you know, the, the body metamorphosing, the body, the, the body responding to a vitalist impulse, maybe. So this urgency to change and transform. And so what transforms also is how, how we must understand our bodies. So not as something that is singular, but something that is collective, uh, something that, so I, the link here is to, um, you know, post-human theory, and, and, and just redefining really even, you know, within the body itself, what, what it means to be, to what, what, it, what a collective practice can be. I don't know, I'm wondering how you feel it in your bodies. Hmm? Ventura, Kira. I love, I love thinking about these issues that way. I think that's how we can do away with the supremacy type of thinking. You know, the mind on top of everything or one single impulse that is in charge of this homogeneous body that is encapsulated inside our minds. I think it's important to think of these different types of communications and connections that happen all the time inside us. You know, white cells, veins, organs that we are not even fully aware of. I mean, we can stimulate some organs in different ways. Our muscles work and are connected to our bones, neurons. So I think our bodies are the perfect example of a collective type of work, work that is developed. And that is because of our differences. Of course, the veins are not the same as the stomach, which is not the same as the femur bone. But you know, these different compositions and these differences, when well combined, can lead us towards powerful experiences, you know, such as feeling the taste, the smells, pleasure coming. So I feel like as a transvestite, I now have a more broad perception towards this 
complex issues in my body, desire, and the ways I can dream and make these dreams come true through different ways, through different um, pathways and other body possibilities. I'm not sure that answers your questions, but that's that's what I would say. But I also wanted to say something else. As, we, as you were talking about the monument of resistance, I actually reminded, it reminded me of James Cohn's a pastor. And in the Black Theology book, he says, the rationale behind liberation is always not understandable to the landlord because from their position of power, these lords never understand what enslaved people want to say when they talk about dignity, because dignity for them means to kill slaves as if they were superior to the others and that as if humankind depended, depended on other people being enslaved. So that made me think. I mean, it's quite easy for the elites to not consider social movements that are so powerful and to label them as not being art or as being or as, as being vandalism when in truth this is a spiritual retaking they are reappropriating these lands that were stolen from them and this is part of the liberation movement which is also a spiritual one so it goes beyond art itself. Um, a partir de escucharle a Ventura, pude como que After hacer... hearing Ventura, I could make some connections better. What I think is beautiful in Tabita's work is how that meditation takes you to all those places through that grounding process. And how through colonialism, I feel that we lost this understanding of our body as a whole. And how we understand our body today through the fragmentation of it. And this makes me think of Lucrecia Masson's theory. She talks about um, fat bodies and she talks about cows, for example, and that has several reproductive systems and through those reproductive systems they ruminate together and there the body gives a signal and that rhythm is respected in the collective And the capitalism that we have now is very fragmented. We have then these fragmented bodies. So I understand the collective when we think about it in terms of the connections I mean, we're not divided, we're not separate from nature. We're connected to it. And another metaphor that I think is beautiful to share from that text is that, for example, when it, there, it's, going, when it, it's going to hail, all the cows come together and they kind of create this like, this mural of, to protect them like a wall to protect themselves and the impact of the hail on this wall 
it doesn't impact the animals. They're stronger because they're together. So it makes me think about that and how we can dismantle these divisions that we have with other creatures as well. I think that one of the colonial tools is that was used a lot is the internalization of the pathology. So it makes me also think about how within that story of the pathology of bodies. I don't know if that really answers your question, Sofia. Yes, thank you so much for uh, these reflections, which I think, I mean, there's so much more to say, you know, for example, I mean, we're, after all, even though we've completely deconstructed this structure, we are in an ac academic conference. And um, speaking of collaboration, you know, for example, Liliana and Felipe worked in collaboration, which is extremely, um, and not, it, it happens, but it is rare. It is not the, the frequent uh, thing to do. So I guess, how does, well, how- of course not easy. Yeah, as a discipline, you know, how can, how can it change too in relation to collaboration, collective practice, activism? How does it need to change? But I guess that these, we have reached um, the end of our uh, allotted time, which is um, really, really sad. Yes, <laughs> unfortunately. And I feel like we really are only warming up, you know, getting at the beginning at the deeper questions that we should, um, we can, we have the opportunity to address. So I guess we're going to have to organize a Zoom party soon for all of us. <laughs> um, so really, I guess, thank you all so much for um, making this panel so rich and interesting, for really mm, talking about such complex is issues that, you know, I think that the question of activism, the questions of resistance are the most um, complicated to talk about. So um, thank you all so much. Uh, Michael, if you would like to say anything, and this is the end of the conference, I feel like we, I should be having a glass of wine. Eu, eu, <laughs> eu, eu estou aqui impressionado dentro da well, I'm impressed. I'm speaking Portuguese because I'm recording this in Portuguese. And if I speak any other language, then I'll hear myself in another language because they will be translating me. So I apologize. Sorry, you're going to have to listen to me through the translation, but it's always a pleasure to speak Portuguese anyway. We got so many Brazilian friends in the session. So this is a pleasure for me. Thank you very much, Keina Ventura. Thank you to the speakers. Well, I think this was the most contemporary session out of the six we've, hold, we've held. Most of the panelists that we've hosted in these roundtables, they were talking about history most of the times. Now I'm speaking Portuguese to you, but I'm also speaking to you from a specific place. I'm in England, I'm part of the University of the Arts London, Sophia is speaking from Cambridge. So we are speaking from a space of privilege as well. Now, considering all of the discussions and debates from this perspective, which is quite a particular perspective, I must say, throughout the years, I've realized that we're sort of attracted towards politics but that only happens when social movements become history. When we look at contemporary social movements, which is the case 
of many of the topics we discussed today, it seems to us that the issue is a little more complicated inside institutions. So this was a major pleasure for me. It was great to hear about these different political and resistance movements. And it's a shame we can't keep on talking, really. It's a pity we don't have more time. This was very limited time, I must say, but this conference, you know, the whole point of this conference was just to kickstart a conversation. This is not the end of the conversation, and we knew we wouldn't be able to get to conclusions. That would be way too ambitious if we expected that. Now, this was the beginning of the conversation. We hope we can keep up either in a virtual or in in-person sites. Thank you very much. One little last word, just to say thank you, Michael and Sofia, for being together and make this possible. It was wonderful to talk around uh, power, art, and be so contemporary, as Michael said. And um, just to say that we are completely connected, and this is very important. This is not only around Zoom. Uh, we need to understand that we are connected for another ways of doing and thinking. That's why I was talking around power and I am already missing our wine and beer and everything that we're going to get. Thank you very, very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Obrigado. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.